Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm from Goldsmiths University of London. For those of you that don't know it, Goldsmiths is the kind of lunatic fringe of London University where all the kind of mad creative things happen. Uh, Damien Hurst and Mary Quant are graduates from Goldsmiths. And I run the Technology Education Research Unit there. We're interested in the interface between technology and learning. Um, and I'm going to tell, tell you about two stories, really, today. Uh, one is the story about learning, and one is a story about assessment. I'm going to spend most of my time looking at assessment, telling the assessment story. But I'm going to start with a, a, sh a, a little glimpse of the learning story. Then I'm going to spend a lot of time on looking at the assessment, and then we're going to end up with the learning story again at the end. Um, and we're going to pick, a, pick that learning story up in the breakout sessions uh, with my colleague Donal from University of Limerick uh, later on this evening. Um, the, the problem with learning and assessment is that they tend to be incompatible. We tend to think of assessment as being testing and learning as being what goes on in good cl creative classrooms. Uh, so really the challenge with the, the, the two stories that I'm telling you today is how to make them the same story. So what you see here is some examples of um, the capturing of real learning activities in the classroom. All of our assessment is task-based, um, and it's, it's based on extended tasks in the classroom. And students um, putting up work into portfolios in ways that are kind of invisible. So here's a student talking about their work, or a student creating a video, or a student doing some drawing, or collecting some data, or taking a photograph. And we've basically we've created a portfolio tool that allows all that just to be done with whatever technology is available in the classroom, and it emerges automatically into a web portfolio. So the particular project you're seeing here is a technology project, a, a student solving a, uh, a small design and technology problem. Um, and it takes place over six hours. But the work that they're doing is, is none of it is to do with them creating the portfolio, because the portfolio creates itself whilst they're doing the work. So they record the audio reflection, save it. In the process of saving it, it becomes part of the portfolio. In the process of recording some data, it becomes part of the portfolio. Um, and at the end of that process, what you have is a portfolio which, is, which has a series of, it's like a timeline. So this is the thing that they were doing first, and then that, and then that, and then that, and then, and it's like, um, it's like a set of thumbnails. And if you click on those thumbnails, they can, all the data is stored behind and they come full screen. So if you click on the drawing, the drawing comes full screen. If you click on the sound file, the sound file plays and you hear the, 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 the voice of the student talking to you. Um, and similarly with all the other elements of the data. So this is like the big picture of the portfolio and any bit of it that you click on, you can then hear or see in full detail. So that's the kind of the portfolio bit of it, which I'm not going to spend too long talking about now, because we really need to look at the assessment problem. And the assessment problem is a real one. Because if we're talking about high stakes assessment, which I think we have to, we have to deal with high stakes assessment. Then you have to deal with the reliability problem. And the reliability problem might best be thought of as the repeatability problem. If I look at this portfolio and I give it a mark, 
are you going to look at the same portfolio and give it the same mark? Is the assessment repeatable? The harsh reality is that currently it is not repeatable. The kinds of marks that we give to these portfolios are not sufficiently repeatable to have them trustworthy in high-stakes assessment. The result of that is that we tend to use in high-stakes assessment, we tend to do not this kind of stuff, we tend to do the things that we can do repeatable assessments on. So we end up assessing the things that can be assessed, not the things that are worth assessing. This is what's worth assessing, but we can't do it reliably. That's the problem that we've been dealing with. So we've had to create a new paradigm of a new model. It's not a new paradigm. It's a new model of how you do the assessment. Um, and it started with Louis Thurston in the 1920s. And he came to the astonishing revelation that comparative judgment is easier than absolute judgment. If I asked you... Uh, we'll try it, okay, just briefly. We're going to we'll give one minute to this. I want you to tell me what the temperature is in this room. Um, put up your hand if you think it's 15 degrees. Nobody think it's 15 degrees? But what if you think it's 16 degrees? Who thinks it's 16 degrees? Anybody think, anybody think it's 17 degrees? Somebody thinks, several people. What about 18 degrees? How about 19 degrees? 20 degrees? We could go on. You can see how much error there is going to be in this situation. Some of you think it's 15. More of you think it's 17 or 18. Some of you think it's 20. We're trying to do an assessment on an absolute scale, and we're rubbish at it. We have got so much error. What Thurston said was, Actually, if you just give people a comparative judgment to make, they're much better at it. To give you an example of that, as you walked in the room this afternoon, you probably noticed a change of temperature from the outside of the room to the inside of the room. In fact, we, we're not, we do not have the time to do this, but suppose there is a difference between the inside of this room and the outside of this room. If I were to ask you, feel the temperature out there, feel the temperature in here, and just tell me which is warmer. This one or that one? Outside. It's a, sorry? Outside. It's warmer outside. You all agree? Well, if, if there were a difference, and if I were to ask you all that question, you would all give me the same answer. That's the point. You'd all give me the same answer, regardless of what the temperature is. Because it's a comparative judgment, not an absolute judgment. Comparative judgments are easy. Moreover, not only are they easy, supposing I'm hot-blooded. I'm hot-blooded. I feel hot wherever I am. Okay, so when somebody asks me what the real temperature is in here, I tend to inflate the answer. My mum my was always very cold-blooded. And you ask her to give it, she'd always deflate the answer. Thurston's law says that Comparative judgment, one of the reasons comparative judgment is so good is that the judge's personal standard cancels out. If I'm hot-blooded, I think it's hot in here. I go out there, I think it's hot out there, but actually even more hot. So my, my metabolism cancels out in the process of making the comparison. Um, Alistair Pollock used this as a device to do reliability studies for Cambridge uh, assessment. And then in Project Eastgate, which we were running at Goldsmiths, we used it as a frontline model of assessment. So instead of using um, comparative judgment as a check on judgments that have been made already, we have used it for doing frontline assessment, for doing the only assessment of a piece of work. And broadly speaking, this is how it works. Um, ACJ is adaptive comparative judgment. Um, 
If you imagine we have two portfolios, they broadly speaking the same. Structurally, they are the same. If you look at box 13, the kinds of things that are going on in box 13 are the same thing as going on in box 13 here. The content is all that's just different. This is a different student tackling the same, broadly speaking, the same task. So we've got two portfolios. Which is better? Well, um, if I were to ask you to mark them on a 100-point scale, I guarantee that there would be a huge amount of error. But we don't ask you to mark them. We ask you to look at it, get an understanding of what this kid's doing in here, and then look at this one and get a sense of what the kid's doing in this one, and then just make the judgment, which one's better? Which is the more comprehensive piece of work? The teachers share this. One of the reasons why conventional assessment is so unreliable is that teachers do it in the confines of their own classrooms. I have my portfolios done by my students and I mark them. You have your portfolios from your students and you mark them. In a digital world, we can all share it. With web portfolios, all the portfolios go into a pot and all the teachers do the, do the assessing. One of the immediate benefits is the teachers see what is going on in other schools with other teachers. So it's a very much a professional development process. So the teachers can share, look at the portfolios, and think about the strengths and weaknesses, and then they make this holistic judgment. Now, you need to have a sense of a round of judging. Um, the, the sample I'm going to show you is of 350 portfolios judged by 28 teachers. 350 portfolios. Okay. Now, a round of judging is when each portfolio has been compared to one other by all of the 28 teachers. So at the end of round one of comparison, I've seen this portfolio against that portfolio. I've made a judgment. And then all similarly, the 28 teachers have done the same thing. And so by the end of round one, each portfolio has been compared to one other. And at the end of that round, all we know is that some of them were winners and some of them were losers. And then we do another round of comparisons. And at the end of round two, some of them have won twice, some of them have won once, and some of them haven't won at all. Then we do another round. Some have won three times, twice, once, not at all. You can see where this is going. What you end up with is a rank. And at the top of this rank are those that have won every time they've been compared or, and or lost every time they've been compared. The adaptive engine is, the, is what selects, it's a very clever algorithm, that selects which portfolios to choose and to which judge, as it were, they're going to be sent. And what emerges is the collective professional consensus of all the teachers looking at all the portfolios. So in our 2009 sample of 350 portfolios, 28 judges, reliable Co reliability coefficient of 0.95. Feel free to fall off your chair. 0.95. That's the kind of reliability you get from multiple choice marking, which also has a kind of error, has a few errors and slips that build into it. 9.5 is an astonishing reliability statistic when you're making judgments about soft qualitative performance like those portfolios. Um, it's reliable because the judgments are shared by all the teachers. It's reliable because they're making comparative judgments that cancel out their personal standards, not absolute judgments against some kind of scale. And it's reliable because the engine algorithm targets and eliminates uncertainty. 
it's also a democratic process involving all the teachers in all the schools. To a, give you an illustration of how it targets the problems, um, the engine identifies portfolios where judges disagree. If you look at this graph, you can see the blue dots are actually the, the, where we believe the portfolio sits. And the tails of, above and below are standard error. And the standard error in some of them is greater than others. You can see, for example, here there's a portfolio with a big tail, and here there's one with a especially big tail. What that means is judges are disagreeing about this piece of work. Because they're disagreeing, the standard error is greater on that portfolio. But, but you can see it. You can see, what it does is highlight the problem for you. So you can pull out those portfolios and give them some special treatment. But at the same time, we are building, in a kind of scary way, we're building uh, a model of you as a judge, as you're doing your judging. Every judge has a misfit statistic. We are all misfits to some degree. So if, we all say, if most of us here say this one beats this one, and you say that one beats that one, there's clearly some kind of misfit going on here. So it doesn't mean to say that the, the one who's in the minority is wrong, but there's an opportunity for sharing discussion about why you think this one is winning or losing. So we have a consensuality measure, as well as a consensuality and misfit measure. Um, the engine does not create grades, it just creates a rank. The creation of grades, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, is a different process as it is with existing high-stakes high assessment. Existing high-stakes assessment, you have a set of numbers, a piece of work gets marked, it gets a number, and it's put on a, on a rank. Then you've got to say, well, where is the A, B boundary? Where is the CD boundary? Where is the EF boundary? That's a judgment process that is a separate one, as it is with this. Um, in terms of reducing the standard error, generally speaking, the more comparative judgments that are made, the less error results. Uh, when we were doing this, the first 10 judgments reduced most of the standard error. The second 10 reduced the rest. When uh, we were asked by our Department of Education, uh, what, um, what's the error that attaches to this process? We were in the delightful position of completely confounding them by saying, what level of error would you like? <laughs> because we can, we can produce the standard error that they require just by doing more judgments. But there's a, there's a point at which is no benefit to doing any more. Once you've done a certain number, the rank order never changes. However much more judging you do, the rank order stays the same. The question is at what point that arrives. We modelled it as 20 judgments. Actually, it's now, with the, as we've refined the algorithm, it's now 11 judgments. After 11 judgments, the, the rank order just stops changing. It, it just stays stable. How long do the judgments take? Well, as you can see, as you would be, expect, first judgments actually take quite a long while because you're getting used to the portfolios, you're getting used to the handling the interface. So this judge was taking 20 minutes to make a judgment. But the next one was faster, and the next one was faster still. And very soon, everyone... Make, is making the judgments more or less equivalently fast. And the mean time, sorry, the median time of all our judges was just over four minutes for a judgment. Uh, when we did a writing test for our Department of Education, it was four minutes, 30 seconds. When we did a work with a Swedish um, assessment agency, it was three minutes, 40. So it works out at around that point to make a decision. It's worth talking about the writing test briefly. We have what we call SATs, Standard Assessment Tasks, 
which are conducted for year 11-year-olds um, as they move them from primary school into secondary school. We test their English and their maths and a few other things. But there was a writing test that they have to do, and it's marked in the normal way. And it's got terrible reliability. And the, so the QCA, the Qualifications and Curriculum Authority, send the results out, and the schools go, no, that's wrong. You know, Peter's not on that level. He's on this level. And Jane's not on that level. She's on that level. So they get lots of complaints and requests for regrading. So they came to us and they said, could we put the writing samples through the pairs engine? Uh, now, of course, we, we designed it for multimedia portfolios, but we could redesign the interface for putting in written work, which was easy enough. So here is a piece of written work, and there was the other piece of written work, straightforward to do it. Um, and uh, they were, there's a kind of parallel display. We could adjust the size of them, and you could kind of flip the pages. There are only two or three pages, and you could flip the pages, and you just have to decide which is the better piece of writing. Uh, better in whatever terms is required. You know, it might, be, might include spelling, it might include imagination, it might include whatever, whatever it includes. You make this global judgment and say, that one's a better piece of work. And that's all you have to decide, which is why it's relatively quick to do. We did it with a 1,000 pieces of work and 60 primary teachers. A 1,000 pieces of work, 60 primary teachers, and we did it in a couple of hours. The overall reliability was 0.961. Uh, the assessment was therefore considerably more reliable than any other assessment of writing that we could find anywhere in the national or international literature. Because it's consensual, it is comparative. When we asked the judges about what they thought about it, they listed these main advantages. Speed. The fact that it's holistic. They can look at this piece of work and make a holistic judgment, bearing in mind all these qualities, rather than having to score little bits of stuff and add it up. What they judged, what they described as increased fairness. They liked their professionalism being drawn upon to make these professional judgments. And the fact that they could see what was going on in a whole range of schools. Interestingly, some of the judges were much quicker than others. And you might think that the quick judges were the sloppy ones who were making quick judgments, and the, the ones who were careful and considered and took their time were more reliable. Not true. There is absolutely no correlation in the data between the length of time the judge takes and the misfit statistic that applies to that judge. You can see why the misfit statistic is an important bit of information to have. Correlation, actually it was a correlation. It was 0 0.002. I mean, Effectively, no correlation. So I'm now going to, oops, I'm now going to revert to the, that's the assess, that's the assessment story. I'm saying use comparative judgment, not absolute judgment. Partly because you can involve all the teachers in doing it, in doing your high stakes assessment. All of the teachers can be involved. You can monitor it for quality, and you can get stonking reliability by doing it. Why wouldn't you? It's a, it's a win-win situation. And you can do it with portfolios which are of the soft, qualitative kind of portfolios that emerge directly from classwork in, in the school. You don't have to do all these standardized test nonsense. You can, you can make it real. But let's revert to the learning story in my last couple of moments. The learning value, what happens when you look at these portfolios as a learner, one of the students. We, so we, we went back into the class. So these, this was the group of students that had produced those portfolios when they were designing their products. And because we'd had that designing going on in lots of schools, we had lots of other portfolios. So we were able to say to this group, um, what we'd like you to do is have a look at 
a, a, a few portfolios and tell us what you think the strengths and weaknesses are of these other portfolios. So they look at these other portfolios and they say, ooh, wow, that's a really good one. And you intervene and you say, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you said that's a good one. What do you mean by good? Well, it's good because it's got this. And it's good because it's got that. And this one's not such a good... Well, why is that not good? Well, because it's not very good at this. this. You're having a debate with the children, a metacognitive debate about what they mean by good in terms of their own performance. And that is the basis for some powerful learning for the children. They don't just do the work. They have a personal sense of what counts as good, which the teacher can then use as leverage to get learning advantage in the classroom. The thing that struck me most about this feedback session we had with the students afterwards is the number of them that said, why didn't you show us all the other ones first? Because if I'd seen all those other ones first, I would have told my story differently. In other words, I would have learned by seeing what other students had done in this uh, in, in relation to this, not just in terms of the content, in terms of the processes that had been involved. So there's a learning power in seeing other students work in relation to these tasks. Now, Donald will be, in, in the breakout session later on, Donald will be showing how this is working in schools in Ireland at this moment, using the comparative engine with students themselves becoming the judges and then engaging in a debate about good and bad, and improvement, and learning. Uh, we're doing it in many countries, including Australia, um, Sweden, Ireland, England, Spain, Singapore, um, and we've done it in many subjects. And it's, it's just, it works all the same. We have yet to record a statistic of reliability that's less than 9.5. It's just unbelievably simple. So uh, there you go. It's a different kind of um, way of thinking about assessment. It's collaborative. It's democratic. Involves everybody in the process. But most of all, it's reliable. Thank you. <laughs>